Well, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Giuseppe Paiuca. Uh, yeah, also, sometimes it's misspelled as Giuseppe. I can live with that, don't worry. Um, I work uh, here in Shell, uh, uh, something like 400, 500 meters from here at the uh, technology center we have here in Amsterdam. Uh, so basically, I'm at work also during the weekend. Yay! Uh, but OK. Um, uh, you will find uh, a teaser presentation uh, with also the data and the code uh, behind the presentation on my GitHub. Um, that was basically a bright idea to hide my code that is skipped. Uh, but if you really, really want, yeah, you can have a look on uh, uh, my terrible code. Uh, by the way, I'm a chemical, engin chemical engineer. I'm not a data scientist. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm not a software, a core software developer or blah, blah, blah. Um, so please, please have mercy. Uh, OK, uh, so uh, why I'm here? Um, if you have the same question, uh, it's a problem, but OK. Um, I'm here because the oil and gas industry, maybe you don't know, but the oil and gas industry deals with a big chunk of data a lot of data, and this data uh, comes from uh, sensors mainly, mainly uh, from pressure sensors, from temperature sensors, flow meters, uh, and these kind of things. Uh, so this means that also our data normally is uh, uh, full of errors, uh, mistakes, uh, outliers, uh, weird stuff, and of course this is kind of a complication. Uh, so, uh, I'm basically, I would like to share with you uh, our uh, workflow, uh, how we do our day-to-day uh, um, -day job, um, and in particular how this uh, um, uh, means in terms of Python. And at the same time, uh, I would like to share with you our uh, problems mainly, in the sense that, uh, yeah, you are the bright people, you know the solutions, so we have the problems, uh, so maybe we can uh, uh, discuss about that after the presentation. Now, a bit of introduction. Uh, this is uh, the uh, field layout. Of course, it's just a, a, a scheme. It's not the real, actual field layout of uh, Appomattox, a project we are doing in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so this does not exist in, uh, yet. Uh, will exist in a couple of years. My job is to connect this uh, tiny yellow uh, thing that are almost not visible, but uh, uh, these things that are wellheads, I connect these uh, wellheads in my model uh, till the production facility, that is the big thing on the uh, top left, uh, and I do physical modeling of these uh, networks. If the network exists, it's, uh, basically it means that they have problems and they want to have answers. If the network uh, does not exist, uh, basically I have to compare different concepts in order to understand um, if there are problems and which concept is the best. Uh, so basically, I will talk a lot of pipelines and networks, uh, but yeah, the old-fashioned concept of pipelines, still pipelines. Now, um, uh, just a few words about the boundary conditions of these physical models. Uh, at the outlet of the system, so basically where the big thing lies, wow, incredible. Uh, basically here, uh, I have the, basically the pressure, the receiving pressure of my facilities, while here at the inlet of my model, I have the uh, temperature and the flow. Uh, this is another uh, tiny little beast. Uh, it's called the Prelude. Also, this one does not exist yet. Uh, will be in production uh, next year, probably. Uh, yeah, this will be the biggest floating vessel all around the world, 500 meters. And uh, uh, all these pi small pipings that are almost invisible here will have a pressure, a temperature, a flow meter, and a lot of other kind of meters. So you can only maybe imagine the amount of data that this beast will generate per second. Uh, well. Only draw so far, this is existing. This is the Gumusut platform in Malaysia. And just to give you a, an order of magnitude, this is a window. So this is a big, a, a big thing. This is the, the helideck. Here we have the flare. 
And that's where the production is collected, processed, and exported normally. And inside this platform and in all our production facilities, you have these kind of rooms, the control room, where you have operators. That's the control room of the same platform. Uh, these operators have to take decisions based on what they see on these screens. Basically, they have a simplified version of uh, uh, the control system of the platform, and they have to um, operate the platform in order to avoid incidents and so on. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention so far is the fact that uh, in uh, our pipelines, uh, we have multi-phase flow. So we have gas and liquids. Liquids because mainly, often, we have more than one liquid phase. And yeah, you may have this nice uh, thing happening. So basically, a bulk of liquid, uh, a big wave of liquids that travels to your system, it's called slugging, and uh, it's uh, our nightmare. Uh, basically, uh, this can happen uh, also when uh, your boundary conditions are stable. So even uh, if your inlet conditions and outlet conditions are completely stable, yeah, you may have this thing. And this is quite dangerous because it can damage your production facilities and also your pipelines. Uh, if, you feel, if you think that I'm talking uh, something that is completely, well, uh, if you want, feel free to ask me uh, to, to stop and ask uh, something. Now, I will share with you four examples. One is about the input and output uh, data check. Uh, the second one is uh, a completely theoretical design case of a sizing exercise. And uh, the, uh, the third and, one and fourth ones are about uh, uh, two fields, uh, one in uh, Iraq and another one in uh, UK. So let's start with the input output. We live in a world of interfaces. That's where the devil is. Uh, basically, uh, I get a lot of data from other departments and from other companies, and I have to run my models, and I have to share with the others, with the other departments and other uh, companies, uh, the outcomes of this study. So it's very, very important at the beginning of a project, at the beginning of a study, to understand what you receive and to do a check on what you have. And in order to do that, I wrote my own library. Yay! Uh, it's called PFAS. Also, this one is uh, on GitHub. And uh, yeah, if you really have uh, nothing better to do, and there are a lot of other things you can do uh, nicely. We have nice weather. But if you really want, you can have a look also about this library. Uh, that's uh, uh, the kind of data I may receive at the beginning of a project. Uh, basically, here we have the liquid density and the pressure and the temperature. It's a 3D plot, and these are the actual values of the liquid density. Now, my question to you is, is this a good fluid model or a bad fluid model? Yeah, you know the answer. It's, it depends. In the sense that here we have a, a big step between this area and this other area. But this one happens at very low, tem well, very recently low temperatures. So this may be something that is realistic, because at the low temperatures, you have phase changes in your system. And uh, yeah, maybe it's also not so relevant for us. These steps here are a bit more scary for me, because they happen in a region of pressure and temperature that it's maybe where my pipeline operates. So, yeah, this one, it's not a great model, uh, and it's not a great model not for, for this step, but for these steps. So you may, if you receive something like that, you may reconsider to re rebuild your fluid model. Yeah, uh, this one is, instead is an example about uh, the outcomes of a, a model. Uh, so basically, this is a, a pressure profile of a pipeline here. And this is the maximum pressure that the pipeline can sustain. Uh, and yeah, basically the answer I got this time was uh, if I have a problem and uh, here at the outlet of the system and I keep injecting mass at the inlet of the system, after uh, how many seconds or minutes or hours or days, I'll have problems. So basically we can run, we can move in time the pressure 
Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, after uh, something like 1,800 seconds, yeah, we will have a problem at the inlet of the pipeline. It's fancy. Well, uh, in the world I live, this is very fancy. So you should say, oh, <laughs> great. At least for management works. Uh, yeah, but this, this is very cool. This is completely done in, uh, in, uh, in Python, uh, because likely the outcome uh, of my models are uh, plain text files, so it's very easy to parse and to process uh, this information. Now, hmm. let's go to a simple pipeline sizing exercise. This is uh, simple in, in the sense that it's unrealistic. The reality is much more complicated, unfortunately. But let's assume you are requested to size a pipeline. Sizing a pipeline means that you have to define mainly, not only, but mainly the pipeline diameter and the thermal insulation of your, of your pipeline. Basically, you have to go from point A to point B in the simplest case where you have a single pipeline, because of course you may have networks. And uh, you have to uh, come out with uh, uh, these two uh, values. Easy. First of all, uh, of course, uh, let's check what we get. Do you think we have a problem? This is an elevation profile. So basically, my wells, my inlet, my inlet mass flow is here, and I have to deliver my production here, and th the pipeline will go up and down following the slope of the terrain. Yes, we have a problem. We have a problem uh, in the sense that uh, yeah, if this, is, is, if this were the real pipeline, well, this is about the size of the Earth diameter. They did a mistake in the unit of measure. This happened to me, really. And this one was easy to spot, but in other cases, it's much more complicated. Anyway, uh, it's time to simulate. Now we have uh, several flow rates we want to uh, we want to transport through our pipeline. We have uh, an idea about the pipeline diameter we want to we wanna have. Uh, and uh, we have a base case scenario. Now, uh, the most important outcome of the analysis will be the real pi pipeline diameter we want to have. So we want to be sure that with the diameter, the, the bigger or the lower diameter, um, uh, are performing uh, uh, not at the same level respect to our base case. So. Uh, yeah, of course, there's a typo. Sorry about that. Uh, but uh, uh, basically, we want to have different diameters. Uh, maybe we have a winter and summer. Maybe we have different insulations. Uh, and we have uh, a, a bit of uncertainty about uh, what, we, what, what is the fluid temperature and the water mass rate. So in this, in this very, very easy scenario, we have almost 800 cases to simulate. Now. I, I have colleagues that if they have to do this job, they manually change uh, almost 800 input files. It's a bit sad, but that's how it is. But yeah, for, with Python, it's very, very easy. We can use iter tools and the product function. If you don't know uh, iter tools, uh, check out this library. It's awesome. It's great. Uh, yeah, and we, here we can very easily create our uh, uh, 800 cases. And uh, yeah, it's simply a matter of processing the text if you want to generate your 800 input files. OK, now we have uh, simulated our cases. Let's see what we get. That's the most important uh, outcome, so the inlet pressure of the pipeline. As I said at the beginning, we, the outlet pressure is constant, and we want to understand what is the impact at the inlet. So, of course, the, the inlet pressure goes up with the, the flow rate. This continuous green line is our base case scenario. And the other two are exactly the same base case scenario, but with the, uh, the other diameters, 18 and, 20, uh, eight, 18 and 16. Uh, sorry, 16 and 20 inches. As you would uh, expect, uh, if you increase the flow rate, uh, the inlet pressure goes up. But for a multi-phase pipeline, this is quite uh, Uncommon for, uh, well, not, not easy to understand if you're not a part of the business. But at low flow, if you increase 
the flow rate, your pressure drop goes down. This is an effect of the balance between friction and gravi gravity pressure drop of the pipeline. But OK, uh, so this plot is important because basically you understand uh, the maximum pressure you may experience in your, uh, uh, in your lifetime. And the blue dots are all the other, all the other combinations. The same uh, for the temperature. The outlet temperature is also another very important uh, uh, parameter, because if the temperature, go temperature goes down, you have problems, solids problem, deposition, basically. And we see that in this case, the diameter is not affecting so much the outlet temperature. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, uh, variance between these cases. So there are other factors that are, uh, uh, that are important, but it's not the diameter. Another very important parameter, another result of our models is the liquid content. Uh, yeah, if you increase the flow rate, you have less liquids stored in your pipeline. That's easy to imagine. But uh, yeah, you see that on this side, these, these are cubes, uh, cubic meters. Yeah, you may have pretty big amount, chunk of liquid stored in your pipeline. And of course, you have to deal with, with this liquid when you do stuff like increasing the production or other transients. Now, let's have a look on uh, an, a real case. This is not the case I will show you, but yeah, that's the kind of thing that may happen at your pipeline if it's slugging. So um, a slugging pipeline, it's a bad thing, bad, bad thing. And that's uh, uh, why I have a job. Uh, and. Uh, Basically, the first thing you have to do when uh, you are studying a pipeline that is doing this uh, nasty job is to understand what is the frequency of this phenomena, because it's a, a natural phenomena with a, a nice frequency, usually. So I got uh, from these uh, Iraqi, Iraqini uh, pipelines uh, two datasets, uh, each one of a few days of production, a lot of pressure, tension, and the useless stuff. And uh, actually, without a unit of measure, but uh, OK. We managed to solve that. Um, and one important thing is the fact that uh, um, one important thing is the fact that uh, the sampling frequency was 86 seconds. Remember this number. Now, let's have a look on what we got. That's the first. Uh, it's not exactly a week. It's five days of production, but okay, it's a working week. Uh, you see that, uh, yeah, this is the liquid outflow from the pipeline. That it means it's the liquid uh, that is uh, arriving at the outlet of my model. In this case, this is an existing pipeline, so this, are real, this is real data. It's not uh, simulated data. Well, it's a mess. A lot of things are happening. You see that here we have periods of time where with no production. That means that the system was down. And we have a period of time where the, the, the production is increasing, because probably they are ramping up the production. Yeah, so what we can do with this data? Basically, we can try to cut portion of the data that are meaningful for us, because we want to understand the frequency of our slugging, slugging when nothing else, or almost nothing else, is happening. And that's the same also for the second. Uh, product, uh, pro the second week. Also, in this case, we can de define two uh, blocks of data that are relatively good. Let's have a look on them. So for each block, I have uh, extracted, uh, cut the signal, and uh, I have uh, uh, re um, averaged it to zero in order to do uh, uh, an FFT, uh, an FFT uh, transformation on, uh, on the data. Well, it's not so bad, but it's also not so nice. Let's have a look on the other ones. Yeah, this one is slightly better. Finally, the uh, third block, and the last one. Now, uh, yeah, this one is nice. I like it because uh, there's quite, th there's probably something else that is happening, but uh, yeah. A lot of other things, probably, but who knows. Uh, if I calculate the number uh, of minutes, uh, uh, the time interval between one slug and another one, I got this, uh, using simply the, the, the highest peak, I get these numbers. And this uh, means that basically in, in these four different block periods, 
production period, uh, the, the time between one slug and another one uh, ranges from 6.5 to 10 minutes. It is a great result because considering the amount of things that, uh, that are really happening in the field, uh, yeah, this variation is not so big. One question for you. Do you think that the sampling frequency, frequency was enough or not? Yeah, that's the answer I was waiting for. Yeah, the, the frequency was, uh, was good enough because it, it was 86 seconds. Uh, basically, we have four or five points uh, per slug. So it's enough to capture uh, a phenomena in the order of magnitude of a few minutes. Last example is about a gas condensate network uh, in, uh, here in the North Sea, UK. Uh, basically, there are a lot of platforms production platforms where there are uh, some wells. In total, in this case, nine production wells. Uh, this production is collected through this big platform here, and after it's transferred to onshore. Now, um, basically, the, if you look here, the size of these pipelines, uh, these are few kilometers. This means this is a problem. It's a problem because it means that in my physical model, I cannot simulate with the fancy 3D CFD stuff, these kind of things. Otherwise, I can stay here till my next job. Uh, I have to simplify the model in uh, monodimensional uh, simulations. And another nasty thing is the fact that most of the, most of the information I have is at the inlet. I have pressure and temperatures at the inlet of these platforms and I have the liquid flow rate here on shore. Now, basically, the, the issue is that I try to correlate things that are happening hours before to what I see here. So there's a time shift between the inlet and the outlet, and this time shift is also time dependent uh, in the sense that uh, it depends on the flow rate we have in this system. So uh, this system, uh, believe me, it was a nightmare to model. It was a nightmare because uh, you uh, need to start from a steady state uh, point uh, of production. And it was almost impossible here because the boundary conditions were changing hardly. And also, uh, you don't, we don't have information about the liquid that is produced per well. And in terms of liquids, the information was avail available, available only on shore. But we managed to do something. We managed to run the model, linking the model with the production database. Basically, the model itself has a nice function that is able to retrieve information from the production database and use this information partially to, uh, to feed the model and uh, uh, partially to compare predictions and, uh, uh, and uh, actual measurements. Why this is important? It's important because uh, in, that, in that way of work, I don't mind about the starting point of my model. I simply follow the history, and I can also replay, replay the production history uh, doing some tuning. And these are the outcomes. So uh, these are two very important parameters in this case. Uh, basically, the glycol and the salt concentration at the mass fraction at the outlet of the, of the model and of the system, of course. You see that, uh, yeah, these are uh, half a year, and uh, yeah, there's a decent agreement. Not excellent, but decent. These, these are the residuals, and you see that uh, the average in both cases, it's zero. This is a very nice thing, because it means that our tuning was successful. And at the same time, you see here that the probability distribution of these, of these two residuals is kind of, not exactly, but kind of normal. Now, is this good enough? Yes, this was very. Uh, this was a great achievement. Uh, it's uh, basically, as far as I know, you cannot do better with a, a physical model. A physical modeling, in this case, yeah, cannot uh, cannot do better. But at the same time, uh, yeah, we had to do some compromises in order to have. Uh, uh, basically a decent uh, computational speed, and also sometimes the model is not accurate as we would like. So is there anything we can do? Well, this is more a question for you in the sense that uh, maybe we can uh, 
implement some machine learning algorithm in order to do the tuning, because as I said before, uh, we had to do this uh, tuning about the liquid inflow, and uh, this was done manually. It was a long and boring process. Uh, maybe we can use uh, also uh, an artificial neural network or a machine learning algorithm in order to uh, generate uh, a virtual uh, metering system. There are virtual metering uh, systems out of there, but they are very simply uh, curve, fitting, curve fitting algorithms. And I think we can do much better than this. And uh, yeah, maybe we have also a physical model. We can create a, a, a terrible hybrid between this physical model and uh, uh, a machine learning algorithm or, or a network. I don't know. I have no idea if this is feasible or not. So uh, conclusions, uh, yeah, it's uh, obvious to you, but it's not obvious out of this room that uh, Python is, uh, or other programming languages, are very helpful if you have to process and reprocess uh, uh, your data, uh, input and output. And um, uh, yeah, one other thing that is not so clear outside this room is the fact that uh, uh, nowadays, we have a lot of cases to simulate, and uh, even for basic and absolutely not realistic cases, you have hundreds of simulations to do. And of course, you have to manage the outcomes of these simulations. And in the end, uh, uh, I, I, this is very important for me. As oil and gas industry, we have a very long and robust traditions of physical modeling. You cannot imagine how sophisticated and how complex are models for reservoirs, for course, that are big 3D beasts. Uh, we do really cool stuff with physical modeling, but uh, instead, the other things that are not physical modeling are not so common. There are some small examples, but believe me, there, there, there aren't significant applications. And uh, we have also a lot of data. Really, we have a lot of data, a lot of data that has to be clean, has to be processed, and so on. But we have a lot of things. And uh, yeah, we barely use this information. That's uh, maybe where you can help us. As you really want, if you really want. And as I said, uh, there are a lot of better things to do. But yeah, you'll find on my GitHub this talk with all the data, and uh, also uh, my library. I had to add this, sorry. Yeah. They were complaining about the fact that I was not using the standard uh, way to, uh, to present, because of course, yeah, you have not said that I'm not the only one with a PowerPoint presentation here. Uh, so yeah, I, I had to, to give them at least this. Please give a hand of applause for proper execution of the image functionality in the IPython. Not only was that an applause for the talk, but also for the proper use of the image functionality in the IPython notebook. Uh, this is, I've, I personally found this a very interesting topic. Are there any questions about the applications of Python maybe for oil and gas companies or companies maybe where there's more of a physical modeling type of uh, structure? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for your talk. I have a question, though, about um, the application because um, well, I'm wondering, are you using right now modeling and physical modeling and uh, these techniques mainly for design purposes? Or is it for maintenance or identifying security risks? Well, in this case, in the last example, uh, uh, this, uh, net this network is existing. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, we were asked to predict uh, the liquid outflow here when they do something, some things here. As I said before, uh, there's quite some distance. So if you, for example, increase the production from one of these wells, you will see the outcome in terms of liquid here after a few days. And this was very important because, of course, you need to be prepared in order to process the, the liquids that uh, are coming. So uh, we normally do uh, our modeling for existing and non-existing pipelines. For existing pipelines, normally we have to solve problems. For non-existing pipelines, we have to compare different concepts, uh, how to link different, uh, uh, how to uh, compare different networks. Because 
yeah, this is, is existing, but of course, you, if you have only the, the yellow boxes here, you may also have the, the idea how I can connect these boxes in order to deliver my production. Have I answered to your question? Mm. Not okay. really. And, not, no, I, I, and one more thing then. Um, when it comes to maintenance and using data, you mentioned yourself um, garbage in, garbage out. Well, a lot of physical or mechanical engineers, they're very skeptical about use of data, at least when I was in the refinery business. It's, it, it's true. Uh, we have a problem with, uh, with data quality, absolutely. Uh, uh, I wonder if, if there's someone that doesn't have this problem, but okay. Uh, basically, old times, uh, we have a repository rel relative to a single specific project, uh, and uh, what you have in that repository should be the truth. Is this the case? Not really. Not always. Uh, and uh, so basically, the step in which you have to gather your data and to, to check your data, to do a sanity check on your data, it, sometimes it's very, very time consuming. Yeah, we can do much better on that. Yes, I see. Oh, two more questions. Oh, boy. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is about the period of data you selected. How you come up to the decision in practice about those block size? How uh, you get a concise with domain expert or data sciences? That is the data we're going to analyze. I think it was five days of data, yes? Am I correct? Yeah, in one case, five, and in the other case, four. Uh, is it enough to make a conclusion with this short period of that? Because one of your parameters was temperature. And in this case, it was not a problem, because uh, Iraq is not very uh, famous for difference between uh, winter and summer. Uh, but yes, definitely. In other cases, when you have big changes uh, in terms of ambient temperature, you, you need uh, to be ready uh, to, uh, to use data from different time periods. In this case, it was good enough, and also uh, the, the, the idea was a slightly different in the sense that uh, we have a problem, we have a problem now, tell us what is happening. So you, we were interested in uh, the few weeks before the now, not in the whole full history of the pipeline. But yeah, normally you should evaluate both. Then we've got another question over here. Thank you for the talk. And I'd like to ask, how big is actually data science in oil or chemical industry? As I said, uh, I think it's very, it's, um, there, there aren't, there, there's no expertise, almost no expertise. Uh, but at the same time, we have a lot of opportunities, in my opinion. Uh, we have the data and, uh, uh, also, I, I think that uh, we are very open to innovation, in particular nowadays. Uh, so, uh, the, as far as I know, there are uh, uh, examples of real applications only in the subsurface world. So, when you model reservoirs, uh, there you have some machine learning relatively well-established techniques. Another thing that uh, it's completely uh, not uh, mentioned in my presentation is the drilling. So it's quite complicated to understand where you should drill your next well. And also for these kind of things, there are some uh, uh, artificial network, uh, uh, neural networks uh, techniques that are used. But uh, yeah, basically the answer is there isn't a lot of uh, experience in that, in particular in the upstream. Then, oh, another question. My question is also about how um, there might be legal regulations in this area. I mean, do you envision a government being happy to know that maybe you were making decisions purely on a, a machine learning model rather than a physical model? Well, um, I don't think this is uh, much of a problem, uh, but not uh, because uh, uh, but not because uh, we have tried. Maybe th this will be a real problem, I don't know. But uh, you have to consider also that our physical models are not perfect. So it's not a matter of comparing uh, the truth with uh, something fancy, nice, nerdy, that is uh, without no sense. It, and 
that's also why I think that virtual metering can be can be something relatively easy to 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 use and to implement in the sense that. Uh, you, uh, at the beginning, you will have a physical model running in parallel with your uh, virtual metering system. And so it's very easy to compare the performances of the two, and it's very easy to convince someone else that you are doing a good job. Yeah, but there's no answer yet. Uh, then, I suppose, oh. then I suppose I have the uh, courtesy of having the final question. Um, so I imagine, you know, because you're mostly working with, say, physicists, I'm assuming, and people with strong technical background. Uh, and there is also the phenomenon that I always experience. That if you get a group of people that are very technical, and then you say, hey, there's this new toy we can teach ourselves, that there's generally quite a lot of excitement. Even if you're used to physical models, um, how is the attitude for, sort of for the engineers? Because it seems like they might be very keen to learn uh, new things, and that's very exciting. But at the same time, these are usually physicists, so they would like to things to work in the physical world as well. Uh, there's a famous motto in the oil and gas industry that we really wanna be the second one uh, who apply a technology, not the first one. And why? Uh, because uh, we like the innovation, we like new things, new stuff, we are very prone to that, but at the same time, if something goes wrong, is one of these pipelines is leaking, is one of these pipelines is leaking uh, in the North of the Sea, you can easily imagine uh, uh, that it's not exactly a good time for us. So uh, that's why, uh, yeah, normally uh, it's very complicated. It's fairly easy to start, to begin with a new technology. It's very, very complicated to deploy this technology uh, throughout our uh, assets all, all around the world. But Python seems to be getting towards an accepted state. Uh, Please say yes. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I'm here to represent that. Awesome, good to hear. Everyone, please give a warm hand of applause for our speakers.